Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Darcy Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of the American Planning Association, and I am your webcast moderator. Today is Friday, if we can believe it, October 1st, and we will be hearing the presentation, Understanding Spatial Identity. For technical help during today's webcast, you can type your questions in the questions box located in your GoToWebinar tool panel, and I'll do my best to try to help you with those. And for your questions for our presenter, uh, again, just type those in the questions box in your GoToWebinar tool panel. We will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. So there's no hand raising, there's no sound for you guys. You just type your questions in as you think of them, and then I'll ask them to our panelists. Coming up next on your screen is a list of our sponsoring APA chapters and divisions for 2021. Thanks to all of those participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible and free to members. Today, we are sponsored by APA Minnesota. So thanks to you for joining us today and for hosting. Coming up next on your screen is a list of some of our upcoming sessions. We are booked through the end of the year for all the Fridays that I have available, and we're starting to book some Wednesdays and Thursdays. Uh, so be sure to check back often as I get information. I'm loading more sessions in. You can register for these and all of our upcoming sessions at ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. Today's session has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing. To log those credits, just head over to planning.org, log into your My APA account. From there, you can either search by today's title or the event number, both of which can be found on our website, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. And if you're on social media, let's be friends. Uh, head over to Facebook and search planning webcast and we'll pop up. And be sure to like us. That's where I post any important information like date or time changes. I also post when we have new sessions available for you to register for. And uh, I post when, um, usually the day before a session, reminding you that if you haven't registered, to register so you can join us. And we record all of our sessions and post them onto our YouTube channel. Head over to YouTube and search Planning Webcast. Again, we'll pop up and be sure to subscribe to our channel so then you'll be notified when we uh, list new sessions for you to view. So subscribe to us and you can view our well over 350 recordings and uh, get notified when a new one pops up. So that's the end of my housekeeping items. Again, as you come up with any questions, just type them in the chat box, we'll get to them. Again, don't raise your hand, that's not gonna help you. You need to type your questions in. Now, before I turn it over to today's panelists, he did ask, he was a little nosy and wanted to know kind of what kind of planner do we have on the line? So I'm gonna launch a quick poll uh, and I just need you to select one. If you're on a mobile device, it may or may not pop up depending on which one you have, what version you have, all those technical things that I don't understand. So I'm going to go ahead and launch this now. Go. Okay. Okay. So we just we just want to know: Are you in the public sector, the private, nonprofit, academic, other? If you're other, just because we're curious, let us know what you do in the chat box. I'll just give it another second here. Go ahead and close this now and I'll share the results. So as I suspected, 62% um, of you public, 24% private, 5% um, nonprofit, 4% academic, 6% other. So we'll see, uh, type it in and, and we'll see uh, what line of work you're in. So that is that, that's who's on the line. I am now going to Share control with Mike Thompson, who is today's speaker. Perfect. And thank you, Christine. And thank you, everyone, for doing the poll as well, too, to kind of 
orient this a little bit. Um, Christine, did you? Oh, there we go. Okay, perfect. Just took a second. All righty. Um, appreciate everybody um, being here, as Christine mentioned too, and thank you to APA Ohio for hosting. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, assuming everybody, Christine, sees the screen, okay? Yes, you look great. Beautiful. Okay, I'm going to turn my camera off just kind of for sake of focus on this too, but um, we'll, we'll all jump back in here at the end. So um, again, appreciate the chance to be here today. Um, I'm Mike Thompson. I'm an urban planner with a consulting firm, Bolton and Mink. We're a engineering and planning firm based in the Midwest with offices across uh, the Midwest and, and the uh, Carolinas as well too. So I'm based out of our Minneapolis office. I've been with the firm for a couple of years. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. To be honest, I, I, I love this topic. I think it is really cool. And um, I think really for me, it is, is continually stretched my understanding of what it means to be a planner and our role within the world and really as a, as a profession, kind of how, how we can or, or maybe should even at times go about thinking of our, our role um, with kind of our, our surrounding context too. So you know, the title is Understanding Spatial Identity. I, I really do think another title could even be Everything Has Meaning to somebody um, as we'll kind of dive into a little bit. So I think that's kind of the teaser for, for where we're going. Um, and I think if it's the presentation on spatial identity and, and kind of spaces, it's, it's really only fair to start a couple of my places. Um, and so we'll, we'll start with that, kind of dig into a little bit kind of for me personally, why spatial identity, what is it? I and mean, what the heck are we even here talking about? Why I think it matters and then implications for us as planners and even um, those of us who kind of dip our toe into the design world as well, too, whether it's engineering, transportation, urban design, architecture, et cetera. Um, I think we're all in good company here. So for me specifically, um, I was born uh, Twin Cities, kind of the Minneapolis St. Paul metro area in Minnesota. Um, I grew up just a few minutes north of St. Paul. I mean, that's kind of my my place when I think of kind of where I was raised in my childhood. Um, and now, I, I, as you can see by the stars, I don't live too far from there, I just uh, across the river, as they say, over in Minneapolis, uh, the other kind of main metro area. But where I grew up, I mean, the places where I think of home, again, that community just north of St. Paul, um, to me, the memories that come back are associated with a lot of the places that you see here on the screen of outdoor recreation, the schools that I went to, like when we were a certain age, Super Target was the go-to spot. Like when you got your your license, you can kind of go to go to Super Target and go one of the uh, stores and get candy and stuff and, you know, recreation opportunities outside, of course, it's Minnesota with the snow and cold. Um, I have a lot of great memories attached to those specific places that kind of make up um, who I was as a child. After undergrad, though, I actually, had, you know, broadened that opportunity and for about the first four or so years, I actually lived and worked across the country. Um, each of those represented here on that map and with a couple of kind of those special places, I guess, to me, kind of called out in those images, including actually Ohio um, and doing work in Cincinnati, which uh, presumably a number of you are from, and I know also kind of across the country tuned in here today. So, you know, again, kind of thinking of growing up in Minnesota, but then taking the next step of I've got these places across the country that I kind of associate with my early professional career and doing community development work and dipping my toe into planning early after undergrad. Um, after a couple years of doing that, though, I actually settled in Nashville, Tennessee for several years. Um, my girlfriend, now wife, was living there. Grad school at Vanderbilt was an opportunity. Um, and so spent, you know, about four or five years in Nashville. And this is where, for me, I really dug into planning as a, as a career in urban design as a profession, um, working with uh, both the public and private and nonprofit sectors there, um, and kind of seeing the spectrum of, of the field there. But again, when I think of Nashville, uh, for those of you who've been there or maybe even from there still, um, we all kind of have our different impressions of, of Nashville, whether it's the honky tonks or, or kind of calmer places. And for me, it's a spattering of all of them um, as well, too. So, you know, for me, I think of kind of my experiences growing up as a tie to these specific places, as I'm sure many of us do. Um, and, and kind of this, again, mentioning, you know, really started to solidify my fascination with place and identities. I kind of thought back through these places and kind of seeing the country in different contexts and the way that people interacted across the country with where they're from or where they're going. And so that to me was kind of the pivot spot to this idea of spatial identity. Um, and, and kind of when I, as I mentioned, think back on those places, it, it elicits these feelings and memories specific to those locations. And um, kind of as I was getting ready to leave Nashville in 2019 and kind of move back up here to Minnesota, I started kind of really recognizing that, oh, there's more to it than just kind of this emotion I have. So really for me, that's kind of my trigger of kind of what, why spatial identity and kind of what is this thing? I specifically chose 
uh, for this slide here, the super killing park in Copenhagen, I'm sure many are familiar with it, is this really visceral, like dynamic uh, presentation of space. And I'm sure this uh, brings a lot of emotions and feelings and connections to it, positive or negative. Um, I think you know, it's kind of a, a glaring example of how kind of what we're digging into today with space and identity. So for me, I started to really ask these questions then, such as, you know, people experience um, the same place, who are in the same space can have completely different impressions or perspectives of the place. And, and well, why is that? What causes that? Um, how can two people, even if they're similar folks, have completely opposite feelings towards the same place? Um, who decides what it means, kind of the meaning of place or what it represents? Who, who decides that? Who gets to choose that? Um, how does the understanding of a place change over time? And then how do the meanings of a place impact people really and, and how they view themselves and others and kind of collectively as groups or individuals too? And that's really kind of the, the crux of I think today, what we'll get into in just a moment too. Um, and then as I, again, kind of over the past several years, more emerged in the planning profession and urban design profession, you know, how do, how do the decisions that we make in our profession influence people and really people groups? in the communities that we work in, whether it's private or public or somewhere in between, um, in deep and personal ways, basically the impacts of our jobs um, as they relate to space and changing of spaces. So that's kind of, again, kind of what, what drew me into this kind of interest of this idea of spatial identity, but um, a little level setting here out the gate of what we mean, or at least what I mean when I kind of identify with space and identity and spatial identity. Um, I'll kind of a brief forewarning. It'll be a little heady and philosophical um, and even kind of some psychology um, out the gate. We're going to do uh, APA Ohio Friday psychology for, for folks um, for just a little bit. I promise won't be too much. Um, but kind of the, that piece about memory and, and throughout there's going to be a series of kind of rhetorical questions and just kind of raising some issues or ideas or thoughts um, as we go about that that don't necessarily have an answer, nor do they have one answer, of course. Um, and then ultimately, I hope kind of to add some explicit language to something probably implicitly we all recognize to varying degrees. Um, I will say with this image in particular, I, it's I first put this presentation together and started kind of getting in front of different groups, you know, about two years ago. And as hopefully a few people have noticed, a lot's changed in two years, like to almost completely different world in many aspects. And even this image of the Capitol, I mean, when I first did it, it was kind of the transition to, to Donald Trump as president shortly after that. And, you know, even at that moment, it's okay, you know, the idea of, of what the U.S. Capitol means, et cetera, has changed. And think, think of since then with COVID and January 6th and even a new present further, just this image here and kind of the visceral, uh, you know, emotions that it can elicit as people look at this and maybe many of us on this call as well, too. So diving right into this identity and, and physical space, I mean, I understand it as, I think most people would generally describe it as a mental and emotional connection to the places we've experienced or those that we have been in. And as kind of the next step of that, which we'll kind of be hashing out here um, over the next several minutes, is that the meaning and significance that we attach to places, both as an individual but especially um, as groups as well, too. And, and what which just kind of blows my mind, I think is, is really cool, is that how individuals and groups have spatialized identity. How essentially, the notes there, too, our identity is tied to you know, physical places of, of varying sizes. And this, you know, spatial identity is kind of a study or as a, as a research, if you will, kind of an emphasis really lives within the center of, I'm sure, what most of us do every day. I imagine a lot of us are in kind of that planning or design uh, spheres, um, probably some geography as well. But when you add in sociology, psychology, and I'm sure a, a tremendous amount more, kind of spatial identity lives within the center of that. We all kind of touch on that in terms of kind of a, an area of research or a topic. And in terms of like explicit, real kind of research around this, I mean, it's, it's I mean, it's really been going for, for the entirety of human history, not surprisingly. I mean, some of the earliest um, you know, writings and poems, even kind of film and other media too, talks, you know, dips their toe into this. For those who are familiar with um, biblical writings and passages, specifically kind of Old Testament, how when different tribal groups were in the desert kind of wandering, cast out of their homeland, and just the lamenting that happened, missing their homeland, kind of what identified them as a people. I know other religious um, groups have kind of similar texts and um, comparable writings too, um, even back to, you know, kind of that period of time in history. However, when it comes to kind of more formal uh, studies in kind of at least the Western world, um, which I'm more familiar with, um, within the geographic sociology um, and, and political sciences, that's kind of where it, it initially anchored. And a study in the 60s looked at the psychological effects of um, neighborhoods that were relocated 
um, in Boston uh, as kind of the, the urban core expanded and, you know, uh, kind of revitalization as it were, or at least kind of as it was called back then, uh, occurred and for kind of groups who, who were relocated in that process. And it was, as they kind of followed up with them, I mean, it was true feelings of loss and actual grief that um, was noted that these residents uh, were experiencing after they were displaced through that process. And that kind of, I think, was some of the earlier studies that there's, there's emotions um, that can be studied and kind of followed in terms of this process of kind of how we identify ourselves in, in spaces. So a, a little bit of a messy uh, graphic here that we'll simplify in a moment, but the, the landscape identity circle is kind of the, the more formal title for this. And you can see on the outside uh, ring is kind of all the different professions or, or research or academic uh, areas as it were. Um, and many of us probably work uh, at least in kind of those three um, uh, kind of surrounding the one I've just blanked out there. And all of them really do touch on again, the idea of the landscape and how we identify with landscape and, and again, physical spaces which is really anchored in that top right one there, the associations, memories, and symbolic meanings that are attached to place. Um, and that idea of I feelings, which we'll kind of really start now actually kind of pivoting towards. So an easier way maybe of understanding that chart would be that the experiences that we have within a place equal and lead to the emotions and memories that we associate to those places. And so breaking that up a little bit with the first one, the experiences that we have in a place, um, you know, I was kind of curious about the gate of, well, how, how are the experiences that we have shaped? What influences them? I'm sure there's a lot more than the three that I've kind of uh, noted, but I think kind of three key ones more or less is, um, is what we got listed here, with the first one being the cultural expectations or kind of another phrase to think about that is the narratives that exist around a place. What I mean by that is what's expected of you, I mean, in terms of like what you wear, how you should act, what you'll do when you're there, maybe how long you'll be there, and, and kind of who, who may be expected to be with you. And kind of you look at the uh, a church on one side and, and a dive bar on the other. I mean, there's different expectations of you when you enter, or even if you say, hey, you know, it's Sunday, we're going to church, or it's, uh, you know, Friday night, we're going to the dive bar. That's, there's different narratives around that and expectations about kind of what types of behaviors will happen, what you should and shouldn't do, should or shouldn't wear. Um, as well. So again, kind of that being one of the, the factors that uh, influence kind of our experiences. The next one then is actually um, design and physical elements. I mean, what is the space actually shaped as? What's in it? Um, what are those elements? How are they arranged? Who can access it? And then what are people intended to do based on that design? So you see two different parks here, of course, um, that generally speaking, one being more active on the left and more passive on the right. Um, it's, it's expected that there's going to be a different experience in each of those, maybe one more tranquil, one more lively, et cetera. Um, the third one then, um, that at least kind of the, to distill it down, is the presence and actions of others. I mean, other human beings, other people that are in the space with us, um, how many are there going to be? What are they doing? How are they interacting with you? Are they at all? Again, if you think of a, a beach vacation, you're going to have very different experiences um, on the left versus the right. And from that then, of course, kind of leading to what sort of emotions and memories do you have associated with that, which is then kind of the, the, the follow-up then to that uh, initial equation. So this is where in full, disclo uh, full disclosure, I am a planner. I'm an urban planner. That's my background. My wife is the, the therapist social worker in our relationship. And so this is uh, leaning heavily on her and kind of me stretching my expertise. So I mentioned, you know, it's, it's APA Ohio Psychology Friday. So we're going to dig in a little bit, but I promise not too much because I don't want to overstep, uh, you know, my expertise as it were. So thinking and kind of honing in on, on really that emotions and memories and, and how they're associated to place. And this is to me the real pivot point of kind of how we understand this. Memories generally, and again, I'm gonna kind of be careful with how I walk through this, but the general process is, of, is kind of a memory is, becomes encoded within your brain. And we'll dig into that in just a second. It's then stored. And then kind of when events happen or if they're elicited or kind of that retrieval process. So when we think of memories generally, that, that's more or less the, the kind of the layman's 101 um, for how kind of memories exist uh, and created and exist. Um, when it comes to spatial identity and kind of spatial space based memories, um, we'll break that process a little bit about it, kind of on that top, you're in the space, kind of the, however you define that and whatever size and geography. Um, it has those three factors that we already referenced that kind of inform then the experience that you have in it. Um, and this is where, you know, different parts of your brain start triggering, different neurons start being created. Um, when it comes to the kind of the, the spatialization of those memories, 
um, the formation of something called a place cell is created. Um, again, kind of thinking of more modern day research around this, there, there's a number of tests that were done on rats in particular, as tends to happen, of course, um, going through mazes. And, and as you can see that kind of the color pattern there on this little image, as the rat was kind of monitored and as kind of the brain waves and activities were, were monitored as it went throughout the maze, each different area or location had kind of a different um, firing. And so basically, it's kind of the, the piece starts to get put in place that as the rat is in different spaces, it's having different neural coordinations to um, kind of that space specifically, and then by extension, different memories associated with that, which to me is just wild. I, I mean, again, I don't know what the first thing about rats and, and kind of brain science, so to speak, but like the fact that our brain does recognize and have kind of different activity based on space is, is amazing. So getting back then to our flow chart as it, as we have it, you know, the space, the three factors, we have experiences based on that. Um, our brain actually decides kind of in, in kind of that extension of the uh, experience that we have lead to the creation of emotions um, is basically the senses. So memories uh, are formed based on the, the senses that we have. And our brain really decides how important that memory is based on the context clues, both physical the three things that we already mentioned, but even the emotions or stresses at the time. So something that's more uh, fear inducing or more exciting has that stronger uh, emotional reaction and the, the stronger or deep, more deeply embedded that memory is. And there's some survival tactics with that too. I mean, if you think kind of wandering the forest and you know, you know this certain area, there's a dangerous animal or another tribe. I mean, you want to have that memory to not go there again. So there's kind of some primal instincts, of course, attached to this. Um, and then those, through those place-based cells become imprinted as place-based memories. And then kind of the last little bit of our, you know, psychology with Mike on Friday is in terms of kind of where in the brain that happens. So within the amygdala, that actually is the uh, space that creates um, and it releases hormones that create the emotional response. And then uh, are eventually then kind of those neurons and memories are then stored in the hippocampus. They're on the, kind of the right side. So if you can see on that graphic, that kind of the lighter circle is the amygdala on the right side, that darker brown is the hippocampus. So uh, emotions emerge as it were, and kind of via hormones, the amygdala, and then shift over to the hippocampus, which is that longer term memory storage bank, so to speak. So um, to me, I think, you know, as my wife describes it, I'm like, oh man, like this is, this, I think this is really cool. Um, and kind of how to, from a biological and physiological standpoint, start to understand this a little bit. Um, but what's really interesting is that people have kind of, again, implicitly and to varying degrees explicitly kind of had this realization for generations and probably the entirety of human history. Um, just as one example amongst many, the philosopher John Locke talked about how memories plus our experiences together equal our thoughts which then equal our, our kind of our self or identity or as us as an individual. Um, and I think, you know, generally speaking, he's, he's kind of on track with now what science is starting to, to confirm as well, too, that our memories and experiences play a crucial role in identifying and creating our identity. And that becomes the, the framework for how we understand our past and then therefore our future. So, okay, that's the end of the, of the psychology kind of heady spot. We'll start to move more into the practical here now. So um, one kind of like a mini test, I guess, or kind of mini experience, I, I kind of think of, let, let's ground this in our individual experiences. And if we think through initially, at least, um, the home or the homes or that we grew up in or the place you kind of most associate with what you, where you grew up, um, thinking about, you know, the rooms, um, you know, your bedroom, if you had one, and, and, you know, maybe your living room or a playroom or the stairs you used to run up to, um, you know, bed each night or go down to the, the, the smells of, of uh, breakfast being cooked and, and maybe you have positive memories there or negative memories. But if you think of, you know, the home you grew up in, you start to kind of connect it to those memories and the emotions that come back. Maybe it was a welcoming place. Maybe it wasn't. Um, and I think especially in particular um, in relation to COVID and quarantine, which again, when I first created this kind of this uh, presentation was just the early days of it. It was in March and the world was just shutting down. Um, but since then, of course, our home and our relation to it has changed immensely. And City Lab, uh, many of you have probably seen, uh, did a really, really wonderful kind of exhibit of sorts. So they actually kind of reached out to people and said, hey, you know, draw a map of, of how kind of your world has changed, your home has changed. And just the visualization that people have in, in terms of their home about it, it might be at the top right there, just kind of it's your balcony window and that's your world. Um, or maybe the bottom left where it's just your bedroom, more or less, and that's your connection. But I think, too, what's interesting is, you know, this one always caught my eye of 
the the world around you and outside your home is kind of this almost dangerous place, like this Pac-Man style game when you're trying to avoid the the COVID, you know, germ hopping around and all that. And so again, even even kind of this implicitly, we're, we've had these connections and realizations, especially over this past, you know, two years or so um, about the impact of all this. And for, for me and, and kind of my life and my wife, you know, as we talk about just the, the immense differences, she's from Alabama, I'm from Minnesota. Um, needless to say, there's a lot of differences about how we understand ourselves and the world. And so just a couple listed here, I'm from the suburb, she's from rural Alabama, Minnesota, Alabama, Midwest, South. And, you know, where do we vacation? Minnesota, as we go up to the cabin and lake. For her, it's, it's always the Gulf Coast. Um, and just kind of how understanding those differences and how we understand the, the me and the we and kind of what home is. So kind of formulate this, this rough um, kind of image in terms of kind of how these things all fit together. Um, place as this kind of overarching, the, the lighter gray kind of blob there. You've got the factors that we talked about, that they influence then our experiences that we have, which then become kind of foment, fomented as memories. Um, and really then those memories lead to an understanding of self connected to and kind of with their origin in specific places. Um, and we'll kind of, you know, rehash this and, and kind of dig into it a little bit more as we go through, but that's kind of the general building block of this idea of spatial identity. Um, so who cares, right? Like why, why does this matter? Um, cool, people are connected to the place. Um, and we as planners, why, why should we care? That's always a question I try to ask with stuff like this, too. Um, I think, it, it, you know, at, at a high level, um, you know, the planning profession, we deal every day with how space is used, how it should be used, who gets to decide what to do with that, and kind of who owns space. A topic we'll dig into just a little bit more. Um, I, I try to use this image for, for kind of talk, or, you know, as talking or kind of showing stuff like this, because I think it's a really good uh, visualization of kind of how a lot of the, a lot of the public views us as planners with this kind of mysterious, maybe even evil cabal mastermind, faceless behind the shadows, pointing to a map and making decisions and all that. And, you know, when our job is also to change, you know, how space is used or kind of the rules that govern that, you know, I, I can see where people would get that impression. Um, and so kind of trying to break down those barriers and have a better understanding of the implications of our decisions is really why I think, you know, this is really important. Um, and even taking that idea further, um, you know, on both an individual and group level, which we'll, we'll get to the group in a second, um, you know, again, just to reiterate how these connections that as an individual we create to places, that's the basis of our understanding of the world around us and kind of our role within it and these physiological associations to the physical world. Um, really guide us. Um, there was a, the Atlantic um, in 2011 ran a story talking about exactly this and kind of that home example of, you know, where you grew up, both neighborhood, city, but even like the home style, the type of home itself um, has such a connection to how you're viewed. Um, you know, we could go down the list, I'm sure, of stereotypes of, oh, you're from such and such place or you went to that school and, you know, that means suddenly something for you as an individual. But even further than that, and where really most of today we're going to spend our focus is, the idea of group understanding and kind of as collectives, however we define that, and obviously it's a very kind of fluid uh, categorization, um, how our group understanding of, of self and place is connection, connected and it's kind of a series of, of text here that I think really encapsulate this well about how in making the point that social identities incorporate a spatial dimension. National identities um, are typically spatialized, right? There's a national homeland. We are American. We are from America. You know, we're from Canada. Canadian and, and so on and so forth. Um, what's interesting too, though, of course, is as I mentioned, you know, group is, is such a fluid uh, description that, you know, religious identity in particular, I think has a real close connection to um, uh, space and kind of how space is understood. Um, I think of, you know, for those who are Catholic and what the Vatican represents for those um, who are Muslim and what Mecca represents and kind of those, those physical connections and spatialization practices as it notes there on the bottom um, and kind of the implications of that too. Uh, another example too is kind of my wife and I've been talking about this for probably far too long the past couple of weeks is um, you know with 9-11 not all too far away the, the 20th anniversary um, you know we just had a conversation the other day of you know where were you when uh, you know 9-11 or whether it's JFK or this kind of event too and how that you know very visceral memory is seared in our minds to where we were um, and there's a publication that kind of asked people that. So this is a little snippet of their answers. And, you know, I was in this specific place when I remembered X happening. 
And so now kind of for, for many of us, when we hear something major such as 9-11 or others, we, we instantly kind of put ourselves back to, oh, I was here when that happened. Um, for those of us up in Minnesota, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of kind of identity stuff and images of kind of collectively make who we are as Minnesotans. And you can see some of them on the screen here, you know, Viking Stadium and, and what we have there in the North Woods and even the funny ways that we talk sometimes, snow, food, you know, lake and cabin life, as I mentioned, you know, kind of collectively, um, these start to piece together when we say, oh, yeah, I'm from Minnesota. These are kind of start the types of things that exist within the geography or space of Minnesota, but generally, that represent who we are. And I think kind of when you peel away those, um, it, it starts so you kind of understand who we are better. And, you know, a major one being, uh, you know, if you ever have heard us talk about the State Fair, we love it. It's like our, our big Super Bowl. Um, it, it, I can talk forever about this. I won't. But just we love our State Fair. It's really, it's massive. It's two weeks, millions of people. It's great. But again, this idea then of, of OK, that that's a part of our identity and who we are. What happens if you start to take that away, though, or again, kind of peel it back in a way? You know, it, are we still Minnesotans as we understand it, so to speak? And in fact, two years ago, it was canceled, and it was, you know, like statewide trauma almost to, to a degree. Um, but we'll, we'll kind of circle back to that in a moment, but just kind of wanted to, to lay that there for a moment of if we start to change or challenge these ideas of how we understand ourselves, um, does that change who we are? Um, and I think importantly, a couple uh, additional notes too is it doesn't necessarily follow um, traditional designations or boundaries, whether it's a city boundary, township boundary, your neighborhood, et cetera. Um, place and identity expand can expand beyond that, are not necessarily constrained. Um, some work that was done in the 1900s around the Balkan Wars and, and kind of peace efforts there uh, failed miserably. And part of the speculation was that is bolded there. Um, failure to recognize long-held relationships that different groups and nations had to places and territories that, again, expanded outside of, of kind of new, newly created boundaries or countries or borders, et cetera. And so, you know, place and identity does, isn't necessarily confined to the, the more, you know, the political map or the zoning map or, or however we might kind of define it in, in our role as, as uh, planners. And so then kind of building on our, our graph from earlier, you know, we got our factors within place, leads to those experiences, creates memories, is understanding of self, but really self and group and how we are connected to those places. And so we're starting to kind of add on some layers and levels here. But there's a problem. And, and hopefully a few people are like, oh, yeah, you know, the Minnesota example, cool. But like, what about people who don't associate those things uh, to be in Minnesota? And I think you're, you're jumping ahead and are right on track with kind of where we're going, because to me, this is this is the, the pivotal piece. And I think kind of much of what our country is going through these days can probably be traced to some degree um, to this idea that, um, you know, the same place or the same space can be construed by different groups in different ways and that, you know, different groups can see the same place um differently and they can have different meanings etc um i for those who are from ohio i don't mean to throw shade uh, on ohio at all i just i happened to work in cincinnati in the past i'm familiar with kind of the the transitions that over the rhine went through and it's always fascinating to me how this neighborhood which was it's kind of noted there i think by politico the politico the nation's most dangerous neighborhood and kind of all the efforts and work that came to transition it to, to something completely different and kind of what what now others might say is this kind of gentrification and um you know disguises urban revitalization too so you can kind of have the same neighborhood that has kind of gone through transitions or a space um and different groups depending who you ask have a different perception on if it was great or maybe it wasn't so great or maybe there wasn't all these good things that come with it um, a little bit more visceral example, though, I mentioned being living in Nashville and being down there for, for a number of years. Um, this is um, kind of the, the city hall, as it were, um, with this kind of central um, public space in front of it. Um, it. It's oftentimes referred to as the, um, the, the lawn, the front lawn of Nashville. And so it used to be on the left there, this really decrepit parking lot, terrible use. And several years ago, it was transitioned to the image on the right. It's really beautiful lawn, open, kind of a space for activities and protests and, you know, concerts and venues and, and really wonderful. The problem is, and kind of, again, thinking about different perceptions of place, um, the, the public square actually used to be an auction block for slaves in Tennessee um, during kind of that period of our country's history. And, and kind of as you peel back again those layers and start to understand the complexity of the place, the highlighted text, I mean, every time I read this, I kind of just get goosebumps and, and, you know, it's hard to almost fathom how more than, again, as it notes here, 
More than any other place in the city, the square represented the commodification and devaluing of black life in Music City, which is another name for Nashville. Moving on then, uh, the fear, uncertainty, and psychological trauma were the defining features of the square for the slave. So you have kind of what's now known as, as kind of this great public space and the dynamic and the political seat of power. Um, however, if you ask another certain group of people, psychological trauma as a defining feature of what that represents. And I think to me, what's, what's, what really gets at is how you can have both of these kind of events or experiences or history happening simultaneously in terms of kind of their, their connection to place of, uh, you know, going from a slave bot, uh, slave auction to kind of this, you know, if I can be frank, being a white person, uh, oh, a white, you know, hangout space for, for cool um, parties and for young people to kind of be and, and hang out. So, you know, it's, it's complex. It's tough. Um, taking kind of one more step back closer to home where I am now, and um, apologies in advance, the, the images didn't quite um, line up with animations, but Twin Cities is often, as you know, we love telling everybody, oh, yeah, it's a great place to live, and we're ranked uh, high and all this kind of stuff. But as, as that image there alludes to, you know, we're great for who? Um, us as a state have a lot of wonderful things, but for who? And especially if you're a, a BIPOC um, member and community member in Minnesota, it may not actually be so great. We have some of the worst um, racial equality stats um, really of any state, actually. And there's been a kind of a lot of work around that, too. And again, it gets this idea of, you know, who you are and which groups you associate with can have completely different perspectives on space and kind of what it represents to you or maybe what it doesn't represent. And so who or what determines, and kind of getting back to those questions I asked earlier, well, really, who does determine what a place means? And, and probably not a surprise to a lot of us, it really is often the dominant social groups, the, you know, dominant systems, uh, economic, political, social, et cetera, or even, you know, in institutions, et cetera, and especially financial, um, often at the expense of subgroups or kind of the, and, and really what, to me, that is important to realize that kind of it creates, you know, insiders and outsiders and really then the other, so to speak. Um, thinking back on, you know, the Minnesota examples, if you, if you ask most of us up here, we'll probably say this, but even in saying that, when I say the most of us, I'm implicitly thinking, oh yeah, you know, white people like me who had similar experiences and all that. But as much as these, uh, you know, images or examples uh, embody what it means to be Minnesotan, so do every single one of these as well too. But because of, you know, who kind of decides what space means and, and kind of what it means to be Minnesotan, these aren't highlighted as much. These aren't as well known. Um, and again, I mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, some kind of, you know, tensions in the country these days and kind of just the cultural and political landscape as it were, you know, I, I do, I do think to some degree that kind of as our country continues to change and as kind of space, whether it's the country or, or more local to home, as that changes, um, you know, that kind of creates division and kind of a, a reaction to the world around you changing, which we'll hit on it more in just a moment. And because and again, I mean, our spaces they are changing right and construction every day and um as the world shifts and change so too is kind of our understanding of self um i i, I love this image a lot because for those who have seen the movie up you know kind of the at the time at least kind of the curmudgeonly old man who refused to to sell his house to the big developer the big bad developer and so he held it out his house and someone did kind of a rendering of it here and i you know as i kind of dug more into this idea of spatial identity it's it, to me not so much you know oh you know, don't take what's mine, but it's also don't take what's me. If you remember from that movie, the early stages, it go or the earlier scenes of the movie, it goes through all the memories he had with his wife who had recently passed that had happened in and around that home and how kind of that emotional connection he has to her via the home. So it really isn't a, you know, don't take my house. It's don't take this part of me. Um, there's a story in NPR uh, a couple of years back, a, a small town in Nevada, a township there that actually became unincorporated through a series of events. And hearing the people talk about it who, who live there, they literally said, we've lost our identity. We're not even on the map anymore. Like, we, we don't have an us. We're, you know, you can't find us if you're looking. And kind of we as a town, as we knew ourselves as a group, is gone. Um, a little bit less serious example, but I think kind of at least up here in the Twin Cities area, it's kind of uh, gotten some attention recently. Next to the University of Minnesota campus, there's this really decrepit McDonald's. And for those of us who didn't go to the U, um, it, yeah, it's a McDonald's. And we, we appreciate its value to some. But... It got torn down a couple months back and is being, you know, the whole site is being redeveloped. It tends to happen. And there's all these articles that came out, blew my mind about, as you can see there, an ode to a McDonald's, you know, Dinky Town, which is the neighborhood adjacent uh, University of Minnesota. 
uh, Dinky Town's Public Square, and kind of this has a, a McDonald's of all places, and just the emotional reactions and connections that people had to it, um, as you kind of see there on the right, and I think the, the bottom one in particular always gets me is, by virtue of its longevity and accessibility, and really the experiences that people had there, as the top quote gets into, but the McDonald's was able to carve out an emotional space. Um, so far, that is at the bottom of that. And uh, one person tweeting, whoever is responsible for the closing of the Dinky Town McDonald's will not see heaven. I mean, when has anyone gotten so fired up about a McDonald's before? But again, I think that kind of ties back to there's memories and emotions and kind of connections to, you know, those who went there, the university, your time in college, et cetera, kind of tied and anchored to in some degree and some experiences to this McDonald's itself. And so getting back to uh, kind of as planners, to me, this is the whole crux of, of today. Um, and if, you know, kind of nothing else sticks, um, hopefully to some degree this might, that kind of when we as planners and, and those in the design profession make changes to the physical environment, we are literally making changes to those things that tether people to their understanding of the world and their role within it. And really by extension of that, as we make changes to our built environment, we are changing people, kind of their, their psychology and understanding of connection to place, et cetera. So I mentioned a couple of times, too, of how places change and how that can almost kind of be a crisis or a challenge and really kind of further building out our, our, um, our image that we've got going on here. So we've got understanding of self and group. It's connected to place. But when that place changes or there's a challenge to it, that's then what res resorts to or results in kind of that under challenge to an understanding of self and group. Um, and again, I kind of mentioned, you know, you know, the political landscape, cultural landscape of America today, as, as you know, as America changes, I, I'm not excusing anybody. I'm not excusing anything, but I view it as, you know, it's, it's segments of the culture and groups wrestling through with um, their understanding or their, uh, their understanding of how they fit into this country as changing too. So, you know, I try to kind of understand or start at least with that point. Again, not to excuse anything that's happened or not excuse, but um, just maybe a different way to look at it. Um, so then kind of rounding out la a couple last points before we go to just kind of some, some of the outstanding questions at the end here, but Okay, so we've got all these changes, but who who kind of gives a space meaning? Kind of what defines it? Um, I think, you know, the endless list we could talk about, I'm sure, all day long. But to me, it kind of this quote really hits on it, too, that, um, you know, understanding that the, the shape, you know, physical spaces do, you know, the shape that they're given, the experiences they have in them, really shape the understanding of who belongs, the rights and freedoms that people may claim or exercise, especially in those spaces. Um, excuse me, decisions about where we feel at home or out of place, where we may move to, um, excuse me again, or um, avoid or even, you know, much more too. Again, that idea of creating insiders or outsiders and really kind of what, what to me, one way in which that looks is, you know, how, how does the space look? The, the, really those factors that we talked about at the beginning, what are the narratives or preconceived ideas going into a place? Um, how is it designed? And then kind of what are other people doing? So I, I show this series of examples here because, you know, different groups or different people may feel more at home or less at home, kind of given any of these situations. Um, some much more explicit, like the top left there with kind of that hostile architecture. of Clearly, this is not for people, maybe someone who would want to sit there or even sleep there. This is not for you. You are not meant to be here. Um, others may be a little less explicit, like on the bottom right there, it's kind of a, it's a dive bar, Christmas themed uh, karaoke bar in Nashville. It's in a double wide trailer. Some people will say, giddy up, let's go. Like I'm all there. Other people may not be as so much. And so, and of course, everything in between, as you can say. So the, really the point is that kind of who is welcome in a space? Who is it designed for? And really kind of based on kind of all this stuff, you know, the, the branding of a place. Um, what is kind of our, our preconceived ideas going into it um, as well, too? So last point then before kind of some rhetorical questions, and then we can, we can open up some Q&A here um, in just a little bit. But um, just kind of a, a note. Uh, I don't mean to pick on Starbucks, but I'm also going to pick on them because they're pretty easy to. But I think it's just kind of a, a, another thing to consider is how um, many places it's just kind of the, the losing or the loss of a uniqueness of space. Um, it, it, tons of reasons this may, way too many to go into. Um, I think just kind of, you know, as, as globalization and financial structures and the funding systems, et cetera, and, and the, the barriers that are increasing to development and kind of the, the shaping of places to how, how kind of places as they change and are losing uniqueness, right? Like kind of everything's starting to feel like itself, including of course, as we see here, uh, the Starbucks as an easy target. So someone like Starbucks, if someone, you know, is drinking it right now, send me the, all the hate mail you want, that's fine, you know, that's whatever, just as an example. 
Um, okay, so rounding home here, as, as we kind of wrap up, um, some implications for us as planners and, and those who might be kind of within the design profession as well. And I think for a lot of this little, little series of kind of rhetorical questions or kind of just thoughts um, thrown out here as we as we wrap up. Um, so to me, kind of as a recap, you know, we as planners, we're integ integral in, de in guiding changes to the built environment, right? Whether it's setting policies through zoning codes, subsequent ordinances, um, whether it's implementing um, those policies or even just kind of reviewing design plans, et cetera. Um, however our role might be, we are an integral component of guiding that change. Um, to me at least, understanding spatial identity, you know, deepens our understanding of what connects people to place around them. Um, roots us more in um, than kind of our, our sister fields, as it were, uh, those that you can kind of see down there. But really, just kind of again reiterate that when we make changes to the built environment, we are literally changing personal and community identity. And I don't say that as a we should never change anything, because I definitely don't don't ascribe to that belief or that thought that oh well you know we're changing someone's understanding of their their role in the world we better not touch anything and just leave it as is or even go back you know i think change can be good and healthy it's more so if nothing else a word of caution and kind of greater realization that uh the full implications of what we do and for me i try to make it a personal challenge to kind of soften my perception especially when we get under uh, angry community members or, or people you know, we've all got those stories of, of the, the group or the small individuals who kind of come to a, a community meeting and um, they've got their, their all their notes and they're fired up and they're ready to stop whatever it is that, that you dumb planners are doing, right? Um, you know, not that I'm going to try to like, you know, okay, yeah, do it, say whatever you want and I'll believe you, but more so kind of soften and start to put myself in their place, so to speak, of kind of what's the deeper root maybe of, of what some of their stuff might be getting at. Not always, but, you know, a, start, a potential helpful starting point. So then kind of some, some additional implications. Um, and again, these are high level. I don't need to ascribe, okay, here's your, your 10 steps to, to fix everything and, and do great stuff all the time. Just kind of some, some higher level, um, you know, recommendations or kind of implications maybe. Of, um, when it comes to space and changing places, uh, learn the history and, and as able to let the community tell it and kind of the empowerment that comes with that and the honoring of uh, those who have that lived experience and lived history. And again, that, that connection of let them tell who they are. Um, via their their surroundings, and there's you know multitudes of histories and understandings that of course can be complex and unclear and oftentimes conflicting as we talked about earlier. Um, as able to like I, I recommend kind of finding ways to lean into that and acknowledge that um, you know it, it's it's messy, but I think that's to me like the good work that goes into you know building community led change and, and things like such as that, and then ultimately respecting those um, for what came before us. Um, check our process. I know obviously with the past several years, you know, doing better around engagement and, and community driven processes has really been a focus. Um, and I think just as a, a further piece of that too, you know, our perception or our kind of approach might be different than those, of course, who live in an area um, and creates, especially for those in the design profession, uh, really risks mismatch between kind of the creator and user when those two are so separate, so separate and really bad projects to be honest or even a lack of community buy-in. So resolving that through a process of kind of bringing, excuse me, bringing people into the process, um, better understanding kind of, again, that lived experience as well too. Um, and then with really all of this, of course, relationships. I mean, this is anchored in relationships with those who are, who are living in or are connected to those places. Um, this takes time, this takes a lot of work. Not all projects, of course, can afford that. Um, not all council members or uh, commission members are willing to wait or even give due diligence to that or patience to that. But I think as much as we can kind of build those over the long term um, across single projects and really um, build that buy-in and trust and be advocates for relationship building as much as possible as, again, a way to honor uh, those who live there and have those connections to place. This next one, I just I kind of leave it at a high level, like just build good things. Um, that's a really easy thing for me to say here, you know, sitting at home behind my computer. but um, you know, I, I, I try to always encourage and probably that I'm a part of, um, in kind of, you know, the consulting world, at least try to find, you know, those, those unique reflections of place and, and good design, whatever that means in the context of the project or where you live and work and kind of the process that goes with that. Um, let's just build some good stuff. And again, let's, let's have it reflect kind of these, the, uh, an acknowledgement of the, of the places and experiences of those who live there. Um, I, I really do think is when, when good things aren't built, um, and I know we're not always building them, of course, I, you know, developers and stuff, we facilitate, so maybe you facilitate good things being built, but 
when when we kind of get in the way of that, we really risk a disservice to the public um, at large, um, which I know, of course, our, our code of ethics does touch on, you know, elevating the public good, et cetera. Um, so I think there is tie-ins here as well for us as a profession. Um, language and how we communicate the project and the process. Um, the partners that are involved, desired outcomes, I, I mean, language matters so much, as we all know. Um, both from a political standpoint, even internal to a, to a community or, or a client you're working with, but of course to the public. Um, the example I always use is there, there was a housing complex in a historic black neighborhood in North Nashville. Um, I mean, not to, not to minimize it, but kind of all of the stereotypes of disinvestment and urban renewal, et cetera. I mean, this, this community was at the heart of it. And as kind of Nashville has been growing and changing and gentrifying, um, a, housing, a housing kind of complex went up and talked about how close it was to downtown, how close it was to Vanderbilt, you know, the richest themed, you know, white school, not white, but richest themed school, and all these really kind of big amenities, but failed to, to mention any of the surrounding historic black businesses or commercial corridor or Tennessee State University, which is a historic HBCU, didn't make any mention of that, even though it was literally blocks away from some of those. And it just focused on, oh, look at all these great things not immediately next to us that you could be next to. I think too, kind of a, another phrase that, I catch myself saying all the time and, and try to do better on describing somewhere as placeless or having no identity when of course we knew that we know that oftentimes there is an identity it might just not be known by kind of um the majority stakeholders so to speak so um just kind of being cautious of how we describe projects how internally can we talk about process and then our outcomes as well too um a final thought then in terms of covid and again initially kind of pulling this together at the early days of COVID, which feels like a, a lifetime ago at this point. I mean, you know, I, I promise I'm not taking a political or cultural stance on this, just kind of an observation that I'm sure we can all agree to that um, being unable to be in the same places or in near proximity that, that connect us, whether it's, you know, your office or um, a public space or going on a walk with a coworker, whatever it might be, I think that stretches us further from who we understand ourselves to be. Um, both individually and kind of our connections to others, but especially as, as groups, you know, uh, my office in, in, in downtown Minneapolis, we about half of us come in and half of us don't. Um, we, we have that choice, thankfully, but, you know, I feel very disconnected from those who don't come in. Kind of my understanding of my role in relation to my coworkers has definitely been stretched and kind of has morphed and changed. And I'll be curious over the coming years and, and kind of decades, really, even how the the implications of COVID in terms of kind of our, our spatial connections and spatial identity and kind of the disruption that causes. So um, if you if this piques your interest at all, which I really hope it does, because I think this stuff is dang cool. Um, maybe a starting place that, that might be helpful other than just kind of the, the Google search is a um, book called Psychology of Place by David Cantor, who really digs into this um, uh, kind of in a more academic and, and kind of at times actually more approachable way um, too. So maybe a good starting place for those who are interested in learning more. But there's of course a lot of resources even just from a, a simple Google search. So um, thank you again. I, I think this stuff is really important. I think it's great um, and appreciate the the chance to kind of get in front of everybody um, virtually here um, and chat for a little bit and uh, definitely look forward to any questions and comments that uh, come out of this for sure. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, folks, again, just type those questions in the chat box as you think of them, and we'll go ahead and get started with a little bit of Q&A. So um, the first one is there's a lot of comments about the up house, <laughs> and I just did a quick Google search on it, actually, and there's a, Wikipedia has a whole thing on the woman who owns the house as the holdout, Edith Macefield, so just Google her. <laughs> it's actually really interesting. So do that, um, and it's totally a real thing. It's a real house located in Seattle, and um, I think based on Wikipedia, what I'm seeing, I think it's still there. It might be like in kind of a foreclosure abandonment stage right now. Um, anyway, <clears throat> so that's that. Uh, let's jump into some questions here. Uh, the first one is, uh, <clears throat> Given the recent call to end single family zoning, do you have any comments on what this means for the spatial identity of communities as a new generation of planners are very much so dealing with this issue? Yeah, um, man, coming for the big ones out the gate, I love it. Um, no, this, this, is, this is great. And obviously the Twin Cities in Minnesota is wrestling with this just as much as anybody else is. And 
Um, some of our local media outlets here have actually done a really great multi-year mapping project showing how outside of the city of Minneapolis and St. Paul, almost none of the surrounding uh, cities across the seven county metro has really any or much uh, multifamily housing and, and the implications of it and really kind of uh, tying back to racial segregation, et cetera, whether intentional as it often was or not. So acknowledging that fully, I, you know, I kind of go back um, as I think about that to that, that I think the comments I made earlier on of this isn't necessarily a we shouldn't change anything, um, but more so just a deeper understanding of when we talk about change and, and changing process, what are the full implications of that? So, you know, those who, who kind of do aspire to the traditional uh, American dream of you get your single family house, you got a large lot, um, you got my two trucks and all that kind of stuff. I'm not making a comment if that's bad or not, right here at least, um, but just recognizing that, that that's a part of how that individual understands uh, America and their role in it and their aspirations and connections. And so a change into, hey, you know what, we're actually going to shift and, and not have these large lot single family homes, maybe duplexes or multifamily. Um, some of the resistance that may come from that does strive from, but wait a second, that's not how I understand the world. And, and if, if that's not an option, do I exist? Is this place for me? Is this community for me still? Um, and then finally thinking, you know, it's an opportunity to help stretch and, and kind of almost recalibrate that understanding the place that people can have. If this place is for you, just maybe not necessarily the way that you've always thought, but we still need you here and you're still a valued member, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there are quite a few questions about books to further <clears throat> this discussion. Um, the first one is, uh, have you read, it looks like Tony Hiss maybe book, uh, The Experience of Place, have you heard of that? Has anyone heard of that? Type it in. Uh, seems like a possible influence for your thinking. Have Have you heard of this book? I I have heard of it. Admittedly, I have not read significant chunks of it as I probably should, seeing as I'm here talking about it. Um, the last firm I was with in Nashville, though, we we kind of would look at it every so often and kind of excerpts of it and how we kind of went through our design process and very much from a design thinking, kind of how experience of place that that book, of course, raises in, in different ways, um, how that all relates. So yes, experience of place, I just wrote it down and we'll definitely be uh, be looking to get a copy. Okay, um, another one, uh, this is sort of like a comment slash question, I guess. Uh, this topic should be part of standard planning curriculum. I agree, highly relevant to this concept is a French philosopher Henry, probably Henri, uh, Lef, Lefzy, Lef, Lefzy. Oh, uh, <laughs> and I took no. four years of modern French and I got nothing. It's L-E-F-E-B-V-R-E. -E. Yeah. Um, he lived for almost 100 years. Um, his, his works have not been widely translated into English. Two works that have been translated are The Production of Faith, and critique of everyday life. Are you familiar with Henri? I, I am. I still to this day cannot sufficiently and with, with any pride pronounce the name. Yeah, in yeah. grad school actually, I, we, we kind of pulled a number of his works that have been translated. Um, I had a professor who got kind of really attached to this, which probably helped drive me. And Lefebvre, or Lefebvre, I'm butchering that for sure. I, I am familiar. I have read those um, and would also recommend a, a pretty heady description of spatial identity, but I think really critical to kind of that deeper dive. In, and and I, I, I'd love for this to be part of standard planning practice for sure. Thank you. Um, this question, do you feel that um, Minnesota has a, a places a high value on planning, perhaps maybe more so than other Midwestern and Southern states? Yeah, uh, awesome question. I would say definitely the metro areas, for sure. And I think some of kind of, eh, generally speaking, I'm gonna get myself in trouble here, I'm sure, but generally speaking, like many places, the further you get out from metro um, kind of areas or urban cores, um, the less emphasis gets placed. I would say with the Twin Cities, at least, um, for those who have kind of been following it over the decades, um, we have a really strong um, MPO basically up here called the Metropolitan Council um, that has 
depending on who you ask, either either an appropriate level or an over heavy handed level of kind of planning guidance. Um, and, and there's a very regional uh, approach to our kind of build out and, and, and systems and networks, et cetera, that the MPO really guides. And there's some kind of tax sharing um, systems that come with that as well, too. So at least in the Midwest, or excuse me, at least in the Twin Cities, absolutely. And I would say some of the subsequent metros as well, too, um, which I could rattle off some names, um, does put an emphasis on here. And, and to me, that kind of further emphasizes that as a planner, like, oh, Minnesota, it's great. That's half the reason why I moved back up here from Tennessee. Um, and then when you peel back those layers, you go, oh, this seems great if you're a certain type of person or in a certain group, um, and maybe not so much if you're in other groups. Thank you. So what we've learned, I'm trying to like summarize and see what we can um, kind of some takeaways for our, our planners here on the line. So what we've learned is that space, space is important. It's tied to a lot of things. And over the past year, we really haven't been in those spaces very often. Um, and we potentially don't think of them as the same thing anymore. Our priorities have shifted. Um, so how can we as planners figure out kind of what, what the new lay of the land is? What is important to people? What, what type of spaces uh, are now creating these memories, these, these emotional ties? Where do we kind of where do we go from here? Yeah. Um, dang. <laughs> I love these questions. This is great. I wish we were like in person. I had kind of this, this back and forth, but no, I appreciate the question. Um, I mean, I'll get in line with everybody else to try to figure out that too, right? To some degree. Um, we're all kind of, I think, in that same boat. Um, through the lens, at least, of spatial identity and um, kind of some of the subsequent questions at the end I brought up, I would ask them, right? Like kind of start by asking people. And as you're building relationships and, and trying to figure those um, kind of components out, I, I think, you know, starting with how, how, how has the last year for you been? Um, you know, kind of what, what places do you go to? Where do you feel safe going? Um, and I mean safe both for COVID, but even safe kind of public safety and community safety as uh, many areas are wrestling with an increase in, in community violence of various ways too. Of, it's a whole nother topic, probably don't have time or should get into today, but I, I think is, is equally important in a consideration. But um, building those relationships and kind of asking people, um, I think just kind of generally what we know of over the past two years or so with public space best practices and kind of how to design that, there's an immense amount of resources that have come out recently about how to rethink public space through the lens of kind of COVID, social distancing, you know, pandemic preparedness, as it were. Um, a group out of Baltimore in particular, I forget their name, but they've got a free um, public space kind of tactical urbanism pop-up design book. Um, if you basically just kind of Google search um, public space design Baltimore guide, something to that effect, you should find it. But um, I'm a big fan of tactical urbanism generally. I think rethinking opportunities um, to program or design kind of our public realm, the streets, the sidewalks, you know, parklets, things of that nature to facilitate human connections and, and more opportunities to connect with each other when that's been taken away for, for many reasons um, over the past couple of years, um, but also kind of to, to create new memories and experiences in you know, in the parklet example, I used to park my car here, but now me and my neighbor get coffee here, you know, something like that, right? And kind of um, building relationships through uh, re-envisioning public space opportunities. So, yeah, I'd say ask, asking people, starting with the relationship building, um, but then kind of poking around and, and as we collectively in our profession rethink what the public realm looks like and should be, um, diving into that and kind of trying some stuff out and just experimenting. Um, someone um, threw a quote in here, and it made me think of a really good question. So first, I'll kind of go through this quote, and it says, on changes to space, the most inspirational planning phrase I've ever heard is David Harvey's characterization of the French guy's core thesis as the kind of city we want cannot be divorced from the kind of people we want to be. And I think <clears throat> totally like philosophically, I think a lot of us are just sort of in this like flux zone where we don't really know what's going on. We don't really know what the future is holding for us. Do we like working from home? Do we miss going out in public? Um, kind of what are we going to like to do in the future? So it's sort of like this coming to self for, for everyone. And, and with that, I guess, 
is a really great opportunity to kind of reinvent our communities. It's sort of like we're starting from scratch almost. Um, so how do we ensure specifically that we take care to include um, the topic of, of social justice in the future of, of our communities and what we want to be? Um, how do we do that? How do we think about that as planners? How do we get our communities to think about that? Yeah. Um, first of all, I love the quote. Um, I don't know if I've heard that one before, but I really do love it. Um, and ties to some stuff. Again, when the firm I was with in Tennessee was it was a nonprofit design center, and so we kind of had some flexibility to really kind of dream big, so to speak, and dream big around public spaces and the way that uh, the city and surrounding area was laid out. And, and we would often kind of push. I'll call it aspirational planning or aspirational design of really um, our cities and communities are reflections of who we were, who we are, and who we hope to be. And again, I'm a you know, recent uh, grad student writing this stuff, and I, I still believe it. Um, and I think kind of then using that to tie of, you know, understanding or, or starting to envision who, who as a community, whether township, city, urban area, whatever, that we want to be, what does that look like? I think it, it gets anchored again, I'm just gonna keep coming to um, relationships with each other and kind of asking kind of people within the community, bringing them into the process and maybe more importantly, molding and reshaping the process to them um, to make them active participants in the world around them and in the, in the kind of planning process. There's an infinite number of ways of that, right? Of you know, just shifting engagement, shifting the types of language you use, um, where we host meetings and how we host those, Things like providing childcare, which I think these days in particular has become, again, finally, um, more of a, of a recognition and highlight, uh, compens compensating people from their, for their time, um, however that looks. Um, something even as simple as existing of either events or festivals, kind of tagging on with those, not creating one more thing uh, for people to go do, and kind of anchoring this all in just the relationships of getting to know people and hearing their voice and being able to speak into, you know, what would you like to see here? What would you like your community to be? And even kind of just leaving that question open, um, which I'll acknowledge, especially in the private sector, can be really hard when you've got, you know, client with kind of your scope of work and, you know, you got X budget to do this and that, and you're always tight on it and said, okay, well, I'm going to tell you, client who never thought of this thing, that we really need to ask people not what kind of a roadway design they want, but what kind of a community they want. And that's a hard conversation. I I'm not saying that any of this is easy, but I think kind of sort of that recalibration, rethinking, and even, um, at least for the private side, we try to anchor a lot of our, you know, proposals or kind of work with clients of, you know, we try to do this, of, of think of, understand a project within its larger context. And even in the public sector, I think that same thing of, you know, public sector folks have the benefit of kind of the, the city or the township um, focus already um, as a whole and kind of how the integration, or excuse me, the, how everything kind of fits together. And then using that to communicate to folks as we're as we're kind of rethinking our, our engagement uh, efforts and, and just kind of relationships as well too. So um, I think that's key. Um, I've got a coworker in particular. Um, some of you may know her, Hyla Mays. She was with the city of Minneapolis for many years, and she's with us now. She really kind of hangs her head on like answering that question well um, is really going to be a determining factor of kind of who we are as a profession going forward. Thank you. Um, so sticking with COVID, because there's a couple questions in here about kind of drilling down with COVID and the changes and how we're going to come out on the other end. And in a lot of cases, um, people are doing things online now, whether it be work, at eating, they're just doing like a quick takeout or, you know, it's being delivered to them. Shopping, a lot of shopping is online now. And these are all hubs for people, where people get together, where they do social things, where they talk, where they meet people. And we're sort of not eliminating it, but not as enticing anymore. Well, at least at the moment. So how do we kind of create safe spaces for people to want to gather together and have sort of that human connection? Yeah. Yeah, I, I again, great question too, and I think kind of we'll we'll run, bundle this in with the you know what happens next from COVID um, for sure. So I don't I don't claim to have the answer per se. Um, I think of course echoing kind of what I've said in the past about asking people and relationships and kind of um, building those. Um, you know, especially today, people rightly so are more selective in where they go, why they go, who they hang out with, whether it's for safety or just convenience, all that kind of stuff, and so. 
you know, to take this to more of the philosophical planning level, probably to some degree, the answer to that question lies in re-envisioning how we design our cities generally. Um, the proximity of uses to each other. If I have to get my car and drive a ways or um, kind of travel a long ways to get to, you know, the, the hangout spot or kind of where I meet people, that'll probably let be less enticing to me than it was even pre-COVID. But if I know it's just around the block or it's just nearby or it's an easy travel distance, removing those barriers to access um, is going to kind of make it easier or more likely for that those to happen. And then even just the design of, of spaces. And, and I'm not an architect. I won't claim to be. Um, but in the past 18 months or so, I mean, there's been an immense focus, of course, on, on uh, pandemic influence design, I'll call it, and kind of how these spaces are actually designed um, to be able to kind of facilitate a sense of, of safety and, and, and um, you know, cleanliness, et cetera, around that. So um, of the probably many answers that are out there, I think mine, again, are kind of rooted in just continuing to ask people and be in relationship with people of kind of what do you feel safe with? What do you want? Um, what are gaps that you have right now? Um, you know, just land use planning generally and rethinking that, um, but then also continue to partner with and lean on our, our design professional uh, partners um, who have also been simultaneously digging into that too. Okay, so both of us are kind of in the Midwest and we experience some weather. You know, we might have um, <clears throat> a, uh, a a wintry morning and a really nice fall afternoon. That's just the product of being in the Midwest, right? Okay, so how how does weather, how does, how does all of that kind of take into, how do you take that into account when you're talking about people and, and places and connecting with the places, particularly in those months where, um, you know, it's cold and it's wintry, and at least for us, um, you know, how do people, do you, have you done some homework on that? How do people still manage to kind of create those spaces for themselves, um, you know, even in seasons where it's not desirable to, you know, go out and spend time out and about? Yeah, no, awesome question. I think for me, you know, that the transition from living in the South in Tennessee to, to coming back up here was really a reminder of that of, oh, winter, winter is a thing I'd almost forgotten. And, you know, I got a lot of thoughts on that, but it's, it's what it is, um, you know, with winter and all. So, um, I mean, that's a key question. I think kind of we as a nation, especially those of us um, in, in certain areas that, that experience winter uh, with kind of sustained snow, et cetera, um, we kind of did a, a universal pilot of that last winter. And, and to me, it comes down to probably two things more or less is, re-envisioning our public spaces uh, and, and prioritizing kind of uh, the public realm and even kind of public private. I think of there's uh, a, a drinking establishment uh, not too far from me and they kind of have this large parking lot and they actually transition the entire parking lot with like the large igloo houses and other stuff for, for all winter because they couldn't, you know, can't hold people inside. And so kind of rethinking the public realm, semi-public in that case um, to facilitate safe gathering. And so kind of re- configuring our investment priorities and design priorities around people, um, which I'd love to see generally. And then from kind of the planning side, um, you know, a lot of it came to, as probably most of us did last year, um, rethinking our existing policies and codes, et cetera. Are they supportive of, you know, these kind of new and innovative ideas? Do they provide space for a business um, or our parks department to be able to kind of think differently and flexibility through temporary permitting or, um, you know, temporarily putting on pause uh, certain guidance and, and regulations we might have as we're able to. Um, so I think rethinking the kind of the policy side from our end while encouraging, um, you know, the private realm or, or others uh, related to it kind of to, to reprioritize, um, you know, humanity, um, public, uh, the public realm and people. Um, and there's a business case to be made there too, right? Like as people don't desire to, or maybe in some communities aren't able to gather in person safely indoors, um, well, there's an easy business case right there. Hey, if you still want income and, and patronage to your business, shifting into outdoors or redesigning it in a way to promote health, um, that's how you can kind of keep your doors open. Thank you. Okay, this question is long and I haven't had a chance to read it yet, so I'm sorry, we're going on the fly. Um, it says, <clears throat> the pandemic seems to have created generally a two-space dynamic, very personal space, such as a home, 
where for some has become both a living, working, learning, all the things space. And then the other space is, is open space, which is a safe place to go if there are people present, which includes parks and trails, like you were just saying, maybe outdoor eating places. And for some, shopping online and delivered, which relates to the home place. Okay. So people talked about a third place, but not if, but now it seems only two places home and open areas. Um, do you think that indoor third spaces, places may not be as viable as they once were? And by third space, we're talking about restaurants, coffee houses, gyms, movie theaters, um, maybe like the local YMCA, um, that kind of thing. Oof, I, sh I sure hope they're, they're here to stay. Um, okay. I mean, again, key question, right? Like I, my answer is only going to be speculation for sure. Um, I, so of course we have to acknowledge that even pre pandemic, a lot of those places, especially retail, um, retail uses were, were starting to struggle and already we're seeing declines, of course, right? We can get into that in another day about all the reasons for that, but just an acknowledgement that this was a trend that was already existing and then COVID kind of just amplified it in, in many ways. Um, so recognizing the larger term of it too, but um, I I am still of the mindset and belief, and I hope it's more than just uh, wistful optimism, that people are still social people, that people are still social beings. Um, we desire to be in, in connections with each other generally, um, and that's gonna take a lot of different shapes, and, and there probably will be some reshifting in terms of uh, usage of kind of the third space, as it were, but I but I do believe that um, when designed well, when placed well, um, when well thought out um, in advance, those places are still viable and especially desirable by enough people to warrant um, them basically continuing. Um, it's going to shift for sure. There there may be less for some amount of time, and maybe another year or two of kind of COVID as as however it manifests. And we realize, oh shoot, like I'm so sick of home, I never want to be here and everything gets filled up again. Um, I, I don't know, I, maybe not, but um, yeah, my only answer is a speculative and, and somewhat wishful. I, I, I choose to uh, believe that there will still be some level of a third space. It will still have a role. And ultimately kind of back to my previous answer that some, to some degree, the, the, the sort of to some degree, it'll be informed by our ability to work with those spaces and, and thinking differently and experimenting in our kind of policy expertise to, to provide the space to do that. Um, I think those will remove barriers to those spaces continue to be in existence. Um, yeah, it's just kind of that, that, that's where I'm at. That, that, I mean, everyone's trying to figure that out and I'm a little nervous, but also I'm choosing to be hopeful with it. You. Okay. Uh, whip out that crystal ball of yours and um, answer this. So, and I'm just, you know, I was reading in the news that um, Cleveland, for example, is getting the eighth most um, amount of ARP stimulus money. Um, and that's going to be coming in, in, in the country. Um, so if you could, if you had a little pot of stimulus money, what would you do with it uh, to sort of increase, <laughs> right? <laughs> Just to sort of, um, you know, increase the the viability of space, in, increase the ability for people to connect with their space. What would you do with that stimulus money? Oh man, what a great question and also way too much pressure for a Friday. Um, but right? I put everybody I promise through. This will be your last question because I've, I've been really, um, Throwing them at you, so this will be your last one. No, no, no. It's it's, it's 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 totally fair, and it's a really wonderful question. Um, partially because I think kind of us as planners have some level of role in you know city budget making to a degree, um, depending on kind of our role and stuff. But you know, if I, I made everyone sit through Psychology Friday, I'll, I'll answer the tough questions. That's only fair for sure. Um, <laughs> So my wife is a social worker, as I mentioned, um, and so my answer is going to be partially influenced by the experiences that she's been having over the last year, right. especially working in communities who have been on the, once again, the the end of so much community violence, and especially up here in the Twin Cities with George Floyd and the ramifications of it, um, as, as people I'm sure are familiar. So I think 
a portion of the money. I would say opportunities to, to invest in people. Um, the city of St. Paul's is experimenting with, I forget the phrase they, their term for, but essentially kind of the, uh, kind of a, a chunk of money that, that families of a certain kind of qualification receive. I think it's like 500 bucks a month and stuff and kind of tier or geared towards, um, you know, essential services and, and kind of re reducing the burdens and stress economically and stuff like that too. So I'm intrigued by that program. I'm not saying, saying uh, sitting here thinking that's what everyone should do, or maybe nobody should do it. I, I, we're in all, we're all experimenting, but I think investing some amount of money in, in kind of families and communities and, and people so as to alleviate stress um, and, and stressors and, and, you know, inequality in, in that regard. So as to then kind of when shifting towards, you know, the spatial identity question, um, people are not spending every moment and all of their energy trying to find a job or where they're going to live that day or what are they going to eat. They can actually focus on um, you know, life and quality things in relation to kind of the spaces and, and neighborhoods and cities, et cetera, that they live in. Um, so that's with one pot of money. Um, the other part too, I mean, I would just prioritize access to the, the public realm, whether that's parks or parklets or even just improvements to, um, you know, sidewalk space or um, things of that nature. Um, the third space investment, you know, maybe within a certain context or community um, that is needed is, you know, businesses don't have the resources or funds to create kind of outdoor or safer kind of spaces. And, and maybe that's an opportunity for, for investment of, you know, business loans, business grants, however that wants to be arranged, um, especially those that prioritize, of course, BIPOC businesses um, and women-owned businesses. I'm, I'm always an advocate for that, um, for sure. Um, but I think being able to enhance access to public realm, however that looks in an area, um, and funds for maintenance um, is my last. And this is a, a, I wasn't given a number with this pool of money, so I'm just going to keep dropping stuff in um, with my answer. Um, but also maintenance too. I think as, as many people know, and, and for anyone who does, deals with maintenance on the call, you understand the importance of that. And you know, everyone deserves to live in, um, in 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 and around places that are that are of high quality and of good quality, and that aren't being decrepit or falling apart. Because I think that then becomes that piece of how I understand my world. If if my neighborhood or city around me is in disrepair and disinvestment, what does that mean about me? Where's my value? Um, you know, it, it, from other people, right? It's, clearly, I'm not worth, you know, investment if I don't have a park that's of good quality or sidewalks that I can walk safely to, or I need to, you know, I'm, I don't have access to X, Y, or Z. Clearly, my role within the world is not one that is worthy of investment, right? So um, that was deeper than I was planning to go, but it just kind of came out. But I, I think, you know, thinking, thinking big picture, thinking broadly of, of really how are we centering people and their experience uh, in the world in, in our finances, that'd be wonderful. Well, thank you for um, answering that on the spot. And I have, I have to tell a very quick story and then we'll wrap up. And it's, it's a good story. And it's a lot about the, the public realm. It was the very end of March, 2020, right? We like just went into lockdown and my family and I decided, and if you've been on my webcast before, you've probably heard this. We decided to just go on a car ride. It was me, my husband, and my then uh, almost three-year-old. And I was very pregnant, and I was very emotional. And we were driving through our metro park, and we are a stone's throw from the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. So we were down in there, and I was blown away by the number of people that were just playing in the park, that were walking on the trails running, biking, like whole families, all the dogs, like the pets, everybody. We, they were just all, and it was like a random Tuesday at like two o'clock, but because everyone was home and they were like, we got to go do something. And it just, it made me think like, boy, I hope that this is going to be standard protocol now, that this isn't going to revert back once all of this lockdown ends. And I hope that people will really start to understand the value of public space and just being together in an open space and um you know that more resources will be pulled together to keep our open spaces our green spaces green um and i just i like i just cried i just cried <laughs> because i was just so happy to see so many people <laughs> just utilizing the park system and it was all kinds of people um and that's what just it just warmed it warmed my little mama heart <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> that's the end of my little story. I love um, it. So we're going to, we'll wrap up here. 
Um, it's Friday. It's um, at least it's a beautiful day here in Northeast Ohio. So I want to get out and go play. Um, thank you, Mike, for joining us today. Thank you for the Minnesota chapter of APA for hosting today's session. This was really great. I had a great conversation with you, Mike. This is wonderful. Um, folks, as a few reminders, log your CM credits for this session. Um, we'll have a recording available on our YouTube channel. We'll also have uh, a PDF copy of this slide of Mike's slide deck on our website. And that is also where you need to go to register for all of our upcoming sessions. So that's ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. So everyone uh, have a great weekend and we'll talk next time. Thanks everyone.